As you look at this photo, what do you see? You might notice the little girl in pink socks. Let's call her Sophie. She's huddled with her friends, perhaps playing a game, telling a story, or planning something mischievous. But the practitioner in most of us might immediately spot a problem. Sophie and her friends are not in school. To address this problem, the aid industry for the last 15 years has focused on increasing access to and enrollment in educational facilities for school-aged children. We've also supported teachers to ensure that children are indeed learning. But this doesn't fully address the problem for children in conflict-affected contexts, many of whom, like Sophie, cannot read at a grade four level even after four years of continuous primary schooling. Clearly, we were missing something. But it was the focus on learning and not just access that would lead IRC to resources that it had not yet tapped. Neuroscience research shows that violence and neglect scar the growing brain. The adversity and trauma experienced during wars and emergencies affect children's memory and their ability to reason, to solve problems, and to express themselves creatively and emotionally. In other words, it affects their ability to learn. But the research also showed that the damage is reversible through school-based interventions. And so the IRC integrated social-emotional learning techniques into its healing, healing classrooms programs in the DRC. And we partnered with academic experts to conduct the first and largest impact evaluation of this approach in a crisis setting. We found that social and emotional learning techniques can improve reading and math performance. This is a significant finding, and we're adapting and testing this model in other contexts where we work, like Sierra Leone, Lebanon, and Nigeria. But what this experience really taught us was that to make a real difference for children like Sophie, we needed to focus on the outcome and not the problem. So rather than fixating on children not being in school and delivering well-intentioned inputs and activities and then measuring outputs, we needed to first start with the outcome that would represent a meaningful change in someone's life. And in education, that means that individuals at whatever stage of life have the necessary skills to survive, recover, and control, regain control of their lives during and after violent conflict. For Sophie and her friends, this would mean that they can read and write, that they can learn, that they can reason, and that they understand rules and can manage their emotions and can solve interpersonal conflict. These are the basic cognitive and emotional skills that got each of us to where we are today. But in order for Sophie to acquire these skills, she would need to be healthy and safe. She would need to receive high quality instruction that is gender equitable and that corresponds to her level of cognitive and emotional development. And she would need to be supported and surrounded by caregivers at home and in her community. So then our job would be to understand what this outcome would mean in a given context and to use information, particularly from those we intend to serve, to identify what parts of this outcome would need support and the most effective and cost-effective and appropriate ways of doing so. So instead of starting with inputs and our favorite activities, we would be starting with a description of what meaningful and measurable change would look like and an indication based on evidence of how this change could come about. This would be a fundamental shift in how we operate. So we did this exercise not just for education outcomes, but for all the outcomes, the basic life outcomes that anyone would want to be safe, healthy, economically well, and to have power over one's life. And we've put all of these theories of change and outcomes and indicators and evidence into what we're calling the Interactive Outcomes and Evidence Framework. It is free and open to the public, and it's by no means complete or perfect. We have a long way to go. So we invite you to partner with us to 
learn more about what these outcomes could really look like, to articulate clear and common outcomes and measures, to grapple and learn about how these, this change could come about, and to generate evidence to fill the gaps, whether it be around education in emergencies or any other outcome. As for this photo, Sophie and her friends just completed an opening the parachute exercise. And this symbolically created a safe space for them to express and regulate their emotions, to listen to and support each other before heading back to their reading lesson. Sophie and her friends are not in a classroom, but they are learning the necessary skills, not just to perform academically, but to live successful lives. After such fantastic stories in five, I don't know how to follow, but um, I'm going to try to tell you about a change process that our humanitarian performance monitoring, which we lovingly call HPM, has gone through due to a health emergency, specifically the Ebola health emergency. I think really direct, honest, open conversation um, is definitely one of the, the the key issues. Don't make promises that you can't keep. Um, treat people like adults in terms of what's happening in the future, what's coming next. Um, and yeah, just don't lose sight of the people in the process. <laughs>